Hi, welcome to IB Chemistry. We're going to be talking about option D, drugs and medicines. And this is video one. Drugs and medicines, um, well, there's a small distinction between them. Drugs are, is any substance that is able to alter the physiological uh, state of the body, can affect uh, sensory uh, perception or sensory information coming into the body, or affect your mood or emotions. All right? So they have a very broad uh, sense or general uh, effects. Medicines uh, are a particular subset of uh, drugs which tend to have have a beneficial health health effect or what we call a therapeutic effect. There are five general methods of delivery of drugs. All right. Uh, first, we could be oral by ingestion, so it's going to be absorbed through the stomach or uh, digested and absorbed by the in, uh, the gut by the intestines. All right. Those are we're talking about pills, syrups, capsules, any kind of uh, thing like that. Second type, we're talking about inhalation. It could be done like asthma inhalers or uh, smoke. It means it's going to go through the alveoli and uh, absorbed by this uh, bloodstream. Uh, the third type is topical. Anything that is directly uh, placed on the skin. Uh, we're talking about uh, creams, uh, nicotine patches, um, but we also sometimes talk about the things that go into the mucosas like eye drops, ear drops, nose drops, uh, all of those are absorbed through um, through the skin layers. All right. Uh, the fourth method is rectal or suppositories. Uh, they absorb through the rectum. All right. Uh, normally laxatives or certain sometimes of vitamins. Uh, the final method is uh, injection or otherwise known as parenteral um, method of in, uh, of input. All right, and there are three uh, subtypes of injections. Subcutaneous, which is just going to be under the skin. All right. Uh, intramuscular, where in fact it is um, injected into uh, the muscle tissue itself. And finally, uh, we have intravenous, which is uh, you find a vein, you inject it directly into the vein, and that is going to be our fastest type of um, input into the system because it goes into the bloodstream and is distributed throughout uh, very quickly. After that, the only, uh, the only other one that is somewhat as fast is through inhalation because the alveoli also contact uh, the bloodstream, but definitely no method is faster than intravenous uh, injection. Uh, therapeutic effect is what we define as uh, the desired effect of a drug or medicine on the body while a side effect is any unintended effect, whether it's positive or negative for a drug or medicine, all right? So an aspirin has uh, the therapeutic effect is that it takes away your uh, pain, uh, headache, or something like that. The side effect is that it thins your blood, and it actually may be beneficial if you want it, you know, if you have uh, a heart condition, but it also could be negative if you have a cut or you've gone through surgery, you don't want it to stop uh, to stop the uh, clotting. So the same effect could sometimes be interpreted as positive or negative. All right. Uh, continuing with this very quickly, uh, therapeutic dose or effective dose is the minimum dose or concentration of a drug or medicine that will uh, have the intended therapeutic effects, i.e., that it would be effective. All right. A lot of times we talk about ED50, which means that it's effective in 50% of the population. A toxic dose, TD, is instead a dose that a concentration of the uh, medicine or drug that will start showing or identifying toxic side effects. All right, um, that happens with many drugs, and so again we tend to talk about TD50 when the toxic side, uh, side effects appear on 50% of the uh, sample population. Uh, another type that we can see is the lethal dose. Obviously, that is the dose that kills 50% of the population if it's uh, LD50. That is never done on humans. It's only try tested on uh, animals. All right. If we look at uh, this, we could see basically the percentages of uh, on the y-axis. We have the percentage of um, patients or sample population, well, we have the dose. The blue is the therapeutic effect with the doses that actually give um, the desired effects. 
while green we start going towards the toxic and red of course is the one the doses that kill that the area here that we have between the therapeutic and the toxic effect is what we're going to call the therapeutic window. Those are the ranges of um, concentrations in which the drug will have the desired effects but will be below the toxic levels. A better way of looking at this is if we actually use the L, the, sorry, the ED50 and the TE50, all right? to put some barrier or some, some limits of what are the concentrations that we're going to be talking about. And so if we dose, and every time that you see a spike up is when we have delivered a dose, we want the concentration in the blood all right, of the drug to remain between the ED50 and the TD50 for it to be effective. All right? We want the therapeutic effects without any of the toxic uh, effects. All right. The other image um, on, for you guys will be on your right side, on your left side. It's going to be just a blow up of what is that um, therapeutic window. If we want to quantify this, if we want to see how big it is, we can have an index called the therapeutic index, and it's the ratio between the TD50 and the ED50. That ratio is always going to be greater than 1, or most of the times it's going to be greater than 1. And the bigger it is, the wider the therapeutic window is, the safer the drug will be. Why do we want a wide therapeutic window? Well, here this graph may help uh, answer this. The general idea is that if you have a wide therapeutic window, as your concentration, as your dosing, the concentration of drugs will remain below the toxic levels but above the minimum effective concentration. Therefore, you will still be getting, getting the therapeutic effect. On the other hand, if you have a narrow window, whenever you get a dose, you may go above and have toxic levels, toxic levels and so therefore some of the toxic side effects starting to show up. And as the drug continues to be broken down in your body and excreted, you may go below the effective dose, and so there will be ranges times when you will not have um, the minimum amount of concentration to actually have proper effects. All right, so that's the general idea. So if you have a narrow therapeutic window, you tend to have this drugs being given by prescription or only given in the hospital under the um, supervision of medical uh, practitioners while wide therapeutic window drugs tend to be the ones we have over the counter. If we're looking at drugs, um, the way that they are discovered and developed is a four-stage four method, all right? The first one, we're looking for um, natural products that may have some type of activity that we desire, and uh, those can be found in plants or marine organisms. Uh, anything that is unknown, we kind of Mush, uh, we kind of blend them, mush them all up, and separate them into the different components, and then we test those to see if they have any interest in biological activity. If we find something like that, we're going to call those compounds our lead compounds because they are going to be directing or setting the direction of the research. This is where we're going to start. We are going to make synthetic derivative and analogs of this particular compound through organic chemistry. And if we use combinatorial chemistry, which is a mechanized method, we can actually uh, create very large libraries of uh, compounds that are very closely related. Those compounds then can be tested using uh, also high-tech techno um, technologies, uh, such as high-throughput screening, in which we take, uh, we put um, some of the compound in an area where you have, for example, an antibiotic, uh, an antibody that will react um, with the compound uh, if it binds properly. It may coagulate or it may change color. And that is enough to tell us this is going to be promising. It may have the desired activity. And from there, we keep on uh, refining and um, 
changing the compound. Once we have identified the compounds that we want to move forward with that seem to have the best activity, we are going to move into stage two, which is the development research. All right, we're going to start doing computer modeling, uh, then testing in vitro, whether it's on tissues or, on or, or directly on proteins. And eventually, we move to in vivo studies, including uh, animal testing and eventually human clinical trials. All right. Obviously, before we can move into clinical trials on humans, uh, this is um, these drugs are tested on animals to uh, have some safety uh, testing to see that they're not so toxic that they will harm humans. All right. Uh, human clinical trials are used to determine efficacy, whether the drug does do the job or not, uh, dosage, how much you should be giving it and how often, what the, the do dosing regime is going to be, and also to determine side effects. All right? Clinical trials normally have three phases. Phase one, small population of healthy volunteers, and you're going to be testing for uh, any side effects. You're not testing whether the drug is effective or not, but just uh, whether what are the side effects that it can cause. Phase two uh, is a little bit larger, and it's a small group of patients, all right? And you're going to be testing for efficacy. Does the drug actually do this? So does, does it do what it's supposed to do? Uh, cure a disease, take away a syndrome, uh, minimize something, all right? And we can also test there how much and how often that should, the drug should be given. Finally, phase three is the large, sorry, the large scale um, testing. All right, we're going to be looking at probably somewhere between 500 to 1,000 people, sometimes larger than that, um, depending on, on, on the actual um, disease. And here we're looking at uh, making it more statistically relevant, re relevant. So we're going to be looking at different age groups, we're going to different genders, uh, races, all these kind of things to see whether the drug actually behaves the same way throughout. One of the things in clinical trials that we have to take into account is the placebo effect. In all three phases, whether it's for um, efficacy or for uh, side effects, we need to check that uh, the mind is not uh, doing this. But the placebo effect testing is most important in phase three. The placebo and nocebo effects are the effects that the brain is going to have, your mind's going to have, on how we think or what we think that the drug is going to do. So if there is, uh, the placebo effect is when we have the idea that the drug will cause benefit and therefore we will have some type of positive effect, whether it's an actual physiological effect or only a perceived effect, um, this may happen even if you have not received uh, an active drug. So if, for example, if you receive a sugar pill but your a headache goes away, that is the placebo effect. The nocebo effect instead is when you actually have a negative effect um, or the drug does not work because you don't believe that the drug is going to work or because you think that the substance or drug is going to be negative. For example, if you take a drug and your um, heart rate increases or your blood pressure increases because you think that that's what the drug is going to do you, to you, that is called the nocebo effect. Since our mind can affect how our body functions, all right, we have to test for that. And so, um, and because our interactions as medical, uh, medical people or and, and uh, patients, if we know that we're getting the drug or that we're giving the drug, we may have um, our mind think about this more. Uh, these tests are normally done by what is called a double blind test, in which neither the patient nor the doctors know who, which are the patients that are receiving the active drug. Only the pharmacist that prepares the doses actually knows who's getting it, and it's not until the end of the trial where uh, the blind is broken and the results are actually can be tested. Placebo testing then helps you determine the benefits of a new drug on the body, um, the actual benefits rather than what your mind may actually influence. Um, once you've done all the clinical trials, you can move into stage three, which is uh, presenting your data 
uh, to uh, the governmental uh, entities that will approve uh, for marketing of this drug. Of course, uh, the regulatory agencies are involved in, in stages one and two, especially with for human uh, clinical trials. But this is a po the point where they actually finally make the decision. Yes, you can sell this drug or no, your drug is not effective. Uh, it's not better than what exists or the side effects are too risky and we cannot have this in the market. Finally, the last step is uh, stage four is a post-marketing uh, review and monitoring. And, and that's to make sure that when we have this drug uh, in the larger market, that there is no problems. There are many drugs that have had to be recalled because they fi we found after they had been approved that they caused problems or side effects that had not been observed initially. One of the most famous cases is the case of thalidomide, which was a uh, drug that was used as um, anti an anti-emetic, okay, which is an anti-vomitive. Uh, it actually caused um, calm down nausea caused by morning sickness in pregnant women. But unfortunately, it's also a teratogen. It actually caused congenital um, defects uh, in which bother, uh, in, in which um, the babies were born with short um, upper limbs and therefore the arms would not be fully formed. Because of that uh, side effects, uh, the drug was removed from the market. And so this is one of the reasons why we always have um, governmental agencies doing this um, um, post-marketing um, monitoring and review. All right, so this is where we start. Um, we'll start in the next video. We'll look at antacids and analgesics. Thank you.